Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, this morning we give you thanks for this new time in the church year as we begin this season of preparation to celebrate the birth of your son Jesus. We ask your blessing on this time that we have together, on the food that has been prepared, and ask that you would help us to become more aware of the needs and concerns of those who are all around us. And all of this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I am uh, happy to be able to introduce to you uh, Beth Goat and the Reverend uh, Clyde Samson uh, this morning, who are both connected to um, ECM, Christian City Mission. Uh, some of you may know Beth. She has been the executive director there for the last 10 years, um, but is about to end her tenure uh, very, very soon. Yes. Uh, Beth came to this work um, after being in the corporate world for 25 years, and she's done an excellent job from what I have seen and from <laughs> what I understand over her during her tenure um, at ECM. Uh, Clive is the um, is the uh, pastor of, uh, and founder uh, of Faith Christian Church of India, which is here in St. Louis. He is a, uh, a, a priest who came here from India with his wife on sabbatical, from what I understand, a few years ago. And um, apparently, it's been a long sabbatical, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, again, has founded a church in, uh, that's located um, at, at, at Saint, what was the former St. Luke's Episcopal Church, uh, that again is now uh, a missional community of our diocese. Um, and so, um, and then in addition to his work as priest and, uh, and pastor there, uh, Clive is one of the chaplains um, at, at ECM. Um, and so after having had an opportunity to hear him in the past uh, talk about um, his interaction with the young people who are, um, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are ministered to by ECM, I think you'll find what he has to say to be compelling. So I'm going to turn it over to them and let them tell you a little bit more about the, the great work and ministry at ECM. Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. Let me know if you can't hear me, but... Um, I see a few familiar faces. I know I've, I've worked with some of you and talked with some of you in the past. Um, as Reverend Hodges said, I, I will be um, retiring close to the end of December. I, the longer the search committee takes to identify the final person, it may have to stretch, but we're hoping maybe not. We'll see. Um, I'm hoping this week is, is a fruitful one, okay? Um, Episcopal City Mission has been, um, it actually started and has roots back to 1894 with um, Christ Church Cathedral. And it was a group of volunteers that went out and sent chaplains to visit people in, in those days they called it the city hospital, the uh, workhouse, anywhere there were people that couldn't get to a church or get to see someone um, to help with their spiritual needs they would go there and visit with them. Um, that went on for a long time, and then in the 1910s, the family court came to uh, Christ Church Cathedral and Episcopal City Mission and said, we want you to come and minister to our kids in detention. And that's where the first start was. Then in the 50s, all the Protestant churches in the city got together and said, you know, we're all doing a bit of everything maybe it makes sense for us to look at doing certain things. And that's when the bishop for the Episcopal Diocese said, we want the kids. <laughs> so since 1954, that's the sole mission of Episcopal City Mission. It is working with kids that are in the juvenile justice system. So uh, we, we call on the kids at the two detention centers. Um, we have work sometimes off and on with COVID and everything, up at DYS at Missouri Hills, which is um, up at the State Park, Bellefontaine State Park. Up, If you just keep on Bellefontaine Road, it just ends right there. <laughs> then um, we've been doing a little bit of community-based programming with um, the family court. These are kids that are court supervised, but they're not being detained. So they haven't done anything violent, but they've got something that they've done that they need to be um, supervised by the court, make sure they go to school, make sure they're keeping a good curfew, um, and maybe they need anger management program, maybe they need a grief and loss program. 
something to help them through what they are dealing with. Chaplain Clive is one of four chaplains. He's our Episcopal chaplain. <laughs> the other th three are from different um, Protestant denominations. Um, but we, we serve the kids whatever they're looking for. Um, sometimes they want to see a Koran. They want to know more about that. So we have Korans in the office so we can give to them. They may ask questions about Buddhism. They, they have an opening. But what you'll find, most of them have had some kind of background, maybe with grandparents, parents, in a Christian church, a lot of them. But um, we're there to answer whatever their spiritual questions and needs are. So I think what we'll do first, before I have Clive talk about his work, is maybe we'll show this video. We're going to keep our fingers crossed for Jacqueline. <laughs> and um, this is a video that we put together and showed at Moment in Time, which is our big fundraiser that's in the fall and just happened on October 20th. Um, there were a table of people from St. Peter's and actually a table plus. So we're, we were very um, appreciative of that. So. The Kazini Mission is an organization that actually uh, provides services to at risk youth in the St. Louis City area at large. Um, they provide those services that will encourage you, that will motivate you, um, that will inspire you to. Uh, be who they actually want to be, despite whatever situation, despite the circumstances, their socioeconomic statuses. The organization provides, uh, I guess, an a outlet and a service for you to be the best and evolve into the, the best person that they can be. I got involved with ECM and working at the detention center because we're all connected. And what each of us do affects the other person. And we need to all realize that. And if one person's suffering, we're, we're all suffering because of it. And we need to be more connected. My favorite part about being a chaplain is the connections with the kids. It is spending time with them and getting to a point where you develop a relationship with them where they feel comfortable and open up to you. And they will share so much a lot of times. And it gives them opportunity to, to pray for them and to encourage them and, and see God really at work in them. God has a special purpose for their lives. Uh, that they're not here by mistake or accident. That there are factors that are against them that may not be against other people. You know, the playing field is not equal for many of these young people. They've experienced some things that uh, many of us cannot fathom or even understand or begin to navigate. The, the children that I'm working with today are the same children that we run across in children's church, that we run across in the grocery stores, that we run across on the youth football field. They're just one mistake away from being there. So these are children. At the end of the day, we're dealing with a 13 and a 14 year old child that needs love. The unconditional love that the chaplain brings to the detention center. A lot of these kids just need the encouragement, just to know that you can make it, that you're more than a conqueror, that we're with you, that we support you. They're looking for that, that, that love, just like any other 13, 14 year old child that you run across. They're not different, they just need love. Those kids typically have not had a lot of opportunities to have that type of relationship uh, with people in their lives. Uh, and you can truly tell that once they make that connection and that relationship starts to build, those kids really depend and look for that support from our ECM partners. Well, as a child myself, I made a few uh, unfortunate decisions that could have very easily led me to being involved with the system. However, I did avoid it because a few caring people came along and were able to help me see things from a different perspective and make better choices. First, understanding that just because a youth lives in a different area or grew up in a different area, that doesn't warrant a bad kid. It warrants a youth that needs assistance. It warrants a youth that needs guidance. It warrants a youth that needs structure. 
they want to use that means organization. But the only way that they're going to get that organization, that structure, that guidance, that love, that compassion, and that understanding is if you have those with the heart to even want to do that. Without ECM in our detention center, there would be a void for our young people, our the ability for them to connect and build relationships in a very positive way. Because I, I think I go back to data. Data tells me that if I can connect my young people to a person that really cares a lot about that individual, I mean extremely cares about that person, those kids will flourish from that. They will they will build a relationship that is, is, is uh, has an abundance of opportunity for growth. By donating what you can to this ministry, you allow us to be able to uh, give you the satisfaction and also, I think, the benefit of improving a young person's life, of giving a young person hope, uh, to pushing a young person towards a dream uh, that is, is rightfully theirs, uh, but has somehow been uh, diminished because of situation and circumstances way beyond their control. And so as a donor, you really get involved personally in a young person's life and what we do here at ECM. Good job, Jacqueline. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I, I don't know if you noticed, there were pictures showing the inside of detention where he spanned the room and there were doors with numbers on them and there was chairs there around in a circle. So I'm going to let Chaplain Clive. And welcome once again to uh, Moment in Time. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the bishop. Okay, Clive. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning with you. Um, I heard so much about uh, St. Peter's uh, Ladu and Episcopal Church, what you do, wonderful ministry um, through the church as individuals and also what you do in the community. So that's a privilege of being an Episcopal priest and, uh, you know, uh, and also a, a priest at uh, Faith Christian Church of India. So I always hear about all the good things that you, you do. Okay, I'll keep it short. I'm a preacher, so I keep talking a lot. <laughs> so uh, if I say anything or, uh, you know, if you want me to stop, I'll stop. And uh, if you want to ask questions in between, you are welcome to do that. And um, uh, please don't worry about, okay? You can just stop me. Uh, 20, um, 22 years ago, I got married to Susan, my wife, she's called as Sujana. Um, in India, I'm from India, Asian Indian. Um, you know, when I, uh, if you ask any Indian, Asian Indian, in India, most of the marriages are arranged marriages. You know, we don't look for a girl or a girl doesn't look for a boy. It's the parents thing. They will find a boy, they will find a girl. So. Um, we don't do that. So most of the time, 90% or 95% marriages are done like that. So uh, 22 years ago, uh, you know, uh, I got married to Susan. And uh, any Asian Indian, if you ask, how do you want a girl uh, to be your wife? I think 9 out of 10 would say, I want a girl like my mom. That's what they say. I want, like, uh, I want a girl like my mom, you know. Because mom comes and gives the bed coffee, <laughs> takes care of you know everything. We go to college, mess up the room, and mom will get everything all right. When we come back, it will be clean. <laughs> so that is how uh, you know we expect. So on the first day of our uh, wedding, you know, after the wedding, that night, um, you know, uh, the first night, the morning we got got up. So I also expected the same thing. You know, I wanted a girl. <laughs> to be like my mom. So morning I got up and I was waiting for uh, my bed coffee because <laughs> my mom will come and wake me, Clive, get up, have your coffee. So I don't know where she is. I was looking for her. <laughs> and, I, and I saw her. She's already ready and she's going out. She was getting ready and she was about to leave. I asked her, Susan, um, my coffee. <laughs> she said, I don't drink coffee, and she left. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I understood how life is going to be. <laughs> 22 years we survived. No, why I'm saying this is life is not going to be the same. It's not going to, as, going to be as we expect. Life, all small, small changes, challenges, difficulties. That is how I see my life uh, you know, in any situation. So detention center, you know, juvenile detention center. Uh, I was a chaplain in a hospital. I used to see a lot of kids coming there, you know, to psych wards. Especially I worked in psych wards, Alexius Arts Hospital before. Now it is called South City Hospital. I also worked at BJC, the psych ward at Del Mar. And also I worked at a Christian Hospital. So I see a lot of kids were brought there from, uh, you know, prison. Uh, so I used to interact with them. Um, where are they coming from? So in India, I used to do that ministry, taking our youth. I was a priest for 15 years in Anglican church. I used to take all my youth, young people to prison, juvenile detention center. So I had the habit of doing that. So here, when I looked at the kids, you know, what they go through, and uh, I heard, uh, and I was then looking for it. Who is doing ministry in the juvenile detention center? And then I saw, wow, Episcopal City Mission, Episcopal Church is doing. So that is where I came to, um, you know, City, um, uh, Episcopal City Mission. That is how I came as a chaplain. You know, um, that's why in a, in, a, in a situation like this we go, already I have a mind of, you know, uh, accepting the kids, um, not with the uh, kind of uh, presupposition we go. Uh, because the life has taught us um, how the kids are going to be. So going there uh, through city mission, Episcopal city mission, uh, the chaplains have already said a few things. We work differently, uh, but with one cause of taking care of the kids. That is very important. The way we function, the way we do things may be a little different from one chaplain to the other chaplain. So what I'm saying here is the how I function, how I relate myself with the kids. You know, um, I would put it in three ways. One is availability. Chaplain's availability is very important in a juvenile detention center. Our availability is very, very important. Because sometimes kids will come and talk to us. You know, they tell some of the things that they don't talk to others. One of the complaints the staff, social worker, or the counselor always tell is, why the kids are not telling us what they are telling you? That has always been the case. They always tell why they didn't tell us. We go and tell them this is what their kids are talking, and um, um, what can we do? And they'll say, why the kid did not tell me? Why I didn't know? So our availability is very important. A lot of things the kids share, you know, they share with the chaplains, which they cannot share with their own staff, social worker, or counselor, or anybody come there. So for that, we need to uh, build trust. We need to be available with them. That to build trust, we need to be available with them. And also, they uh, uh, available to listen to them. You know, that is very, very important. We go there and uh, just listen to them. They tell some stories, some life things, their difficulties. We genuinely, we will listen to them. So being available is something. That is why all through the week, you know, two days I go, Deborah goes two days, and then one day, uh, Deborah, three days she goes, two days I go. So all five days or six days we are available for the kids. If we miss that, they're going to miss the uh, biggest thing in, a, in their life, you know? So if you are not there, um, Beth was also telling, sometimes I, I thought, they don't wait for me, you know? I'm an Asian Indian, how I talk to them, whether they get it. But if I miss one week, if I don't go one week, the kids will ask, Clive, um, chaplain, where did you go? That's what they ask, where did you go? I was waiting for you. You know, that is what they do it. And the second thing, first thing that I said, availability. Second is the opportunity. You know, we provide opportunity for them in various ways. You know, the kids come and talk to us. 
And uh, sometimes they don't tell the others. And they look for you know, opportunity to share what they think, what they want to do in their life. And because a lot of people think they are crazy. A lot of people think that they are not going to make it. That's what uh, people think. But they come and tell us, I want to do this. So we create that opportunity. We, we, we connect with the staff. We connect with in various ways. And ultimately, we'll come and tell our uh, director also, what do we do? We have to do something for the kids. So from there, in a higher level, she takes, takes it up and talks to the attorneys or you know, even to the judge. They go and discuss with them. So the opportunity that we provide being there is very important. You know, challenges are always there. You know, we, we cannot go something prepared. We have to be prepared whenever we go. That's how I see every evening I go. I go well prepared, pray well, uh, read the things, Bible and Bible. We may think this is not important, but the kids there are with faith. So scripture verses, prayer, that really uh, builds them and uh, give them that character, and more importantly, gives them the opportunity to be good and to, you know, to become good. So that is very important. On one of the Sundays, all have divided among you know, Sundays, worship services. One Sunday, I go. One Sunday, the other chaplain goes. So four Sundays, we divide among ourselves. One Sunday, I went with a passage to, to you know, conduct the worship uh, for them. And uh, in one unit, about uh, 15 kids were there. And all of them joined together and said, we are not Christians. We are not Christians, so don't take the worship. That's what they told me. We are, Christ we are not Christians, so uh, please don't take. They don't want the worship, basically. <laughs> they, they, they didn't want me to conduct the worship. So then I thought, OK, OK. Then I put the Bible and took the Quran. They all said we are all Muslims. So I took the Quran. I said, OK, la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. That's what I said. Let's talk about Islam. They didn't know what to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, let's talk Quran. I don't want to talk. We'll talk about Muhammad. We'll talk about it. Because I used to teach major world religions in India. So I know about Islam. I know about Hinduism. I said, OK. Then they understood, no, you talk about Bible. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> Again, I took the Bible. <laughs> I said, you know, what I'm saying is sometimes you go prepared. Sometimes you are a resourceful person. Sometimes you are ready to change things according to that. Sometimes I just go and challenge them playing chess. You know, um, I play with the kids and uh, I, I challenge them. Sometimes ping pong, you know, uh, table tennis, we play. And uh, if you play well, they really like <laughs> Because we can teach them, you know. So we provide opportunities for them to, you know, uh, have fun, uh, to come out of. Sometimes just to take the kid out, you know, sometimes they put the kids in the isolation. They put it, uh, you know, for security reason, they put them. And when I go, they will show their hand. So I, some, some reason I'll give and to get the kid out, you know, to make them out. Uh, one girl uh, was put in the security, you know, uh, a room. For a while, I asked the staff why you put them um, in the security. And they said uh, she gave, somehow she sneaked and gave a love letter to a guy in another unit. Somehow she was able to pass on a letter to the other kid. In. I felt very silly, right? She's only uh, 17 or 16. What would our kid would do? You know, they get attraction or, you know, it's very common. We need to see from our own uh, kid's perspective what our kids would be doing, you know. The girl was put inside. I cooked up something and got her out also. So for some time, we make them sit outside and do all of these creative things uh, to help the uh, kids. And the third one that I would say is uh, positivity. Definitely chaplains going inside. Always uh, we have to create that positivity. You know, people always give negative things. Um, negative um, situations, negative mindset. So people, the kids have that mind, you know, negative kind of mind because people around them, 
the situation things around them always uh, you know inverse that negativity in their mind so positivity is something that we create you know sometimes even the court we have the hope and healing program community program we do that uh, because uh, the court believes that ecm the chaplains uh, can do uh, some kind of positive things in their life i have always been i i got surprised some other things i shared with the kids i think whether they got it or not i'm not sure about it sometimes i think they didn't get it but to my surprise in some of the hope and healing programs the kids get released and come for the community program and they will tell you told that story i remember you tell you told about the monkey story you told about that you know um, uh, duck story so they remember and what you said i really uh, you know um, think in my life so some other things we think we are not doing but definitely uh, somewhere uh, you know it impacts just the last thing i wanted to tell there was a girl uh, five years ago when she was 12 years old she went and uh, uh, robbed a dollar shop dollar shop with a friend and she was recently in the uh, center and she got released but for five years she has been kept uh you know uh in different homes and she could never come out of it and she always uh had this problem so but she never did anything after that only and when she was 12 she did that and after that escaping the home running away those things put her back in the you know juvenile or homes that is what i asked her why did you do that she went and did this with her friends she said i would just want to be cool that's what i didn't understand the term that time you know when she said <laughs> i want to be cool that's what 12 year old is a kid right robbing a dollar shop what what much she would have robbed right putting somebody in danger is yes but she was not given that opportunity to be all right but now she reads the bible so much i believe she will be a priest one day because she memorizes she does so much and i gave the hope probably god has brought you with some kind of purpose equip yourself and go and do wonderful things in the community so this is what we do each chaplain does something different but our goal is to take care of them give them hope this is clear yes um yeah they um it depends uh, what kind of uh, uh, crime they have uh, uh, committed you know it depends on that so they they wait some other some other times they wait for uh, you know a few days few weeks and sometimes it is six months and um, sometimes you know uh, it's longer than that so it depends on the um uh, what offense they have done what is the crime that they have uh, done so based on that they stay um uh, you know in the um in the center so that is growing problem now because they are not getting the dates the court dates uh, recently it has been so crowded probably because of the pandemic so many cases are there the kids get so frustrated so their dates gets cancelled once they cancel it will take at least a month to get it again so even if it is just a, they would come inside for 2 3 days but they sometimes have sometimes they have to stay for a month or more let me add something to that um let me let me add something else to that um sometimes the kids are in detention waiting to see if they're going to be certified as an adult Now, in Missouri, you can be certified as low as 11 years old, 12 years old. Um, but there's some, some things they're doing to try to alleviate some of that. Um, they really would prefer not to have kids in detention at all. So they, when they can, they, 
They let them be out in the community if they're not a danger to themselves or to the community. And that's where we come in with some of our community-based work, which typically it's kids that haven't done anything violent. Um, they're being supervised by the court. Um, they may be living with a parent or guardian, or they may be living in a residential home. Um, sometimes kids will go into detention. They think there's a, a good possibility that they are going to show up for court, so they'll release them. And there's a point system that they use in detention to determine whether a kid is, is detained or sent home to come back to court. Um, and Clive is exactly right. There's been so many delays and the kids get very f frustrated and we've seen adults that are being frustrated. That, that's what some of the, the uprisings in the um, justice centers where the adults are at. Is some of those people have been waiting years now to have their court hearing. So it, it's a frustrating system. It is what it is, so we have to work with it or work within it. Um, the other thing that's happened in detention is there's a law that was passed in 1990, or sorry, I'm sorry, 2019, and it went into effect in the end of 2021, and it's called Raise the Age. And what it did is in Missouri, prior to this law, a 17-year-old was considered an adult. So anytime they were over 17, they went straight to the um, adult system. With Raise the Age now, kids who are uh, below 18, no matter what, go over to detention. Now, even if they're certified as an adult, they may be 14, 15, 16, certified as an adult, they're now being held in the detention center. Now, they may be kept in a separate unit. There's different things. It's, it's so still kind of new how they're dealing with it. But that in itself has caused some challenges because these kids have been over in the adult, well, so when Raise the Age became official, there were kids that were 16 and 17 that had been sitting over in the adult um, justice center. And now they've come back over to the detention center, but there's a different mindset. You'd think they'd be relieved that they're in a system that's a little more um, informal, there's a little more freedom they're fighting it every step of the way sometimes. And, and so the staff has really had some challenges. You've seen kids that have escaped. Some of that is those older kids that, um, as the staff called them, they're a little more sophisticated, a little more knowledgeable on how to do some things that kids that have never been in that adult system. Now, when they hit 18, uh -huh. they do go back over to the, to the adult system. I think with time, and we, have, we get through the kids that have never been in the adult system, but they do something at 16, 17, and they never go over there until they're 18, I think there's going to be a better conditions, better situation. But it's a challenging system. And um, many times they're looking at the kids trying to figure out um, what's the best system for them. And they'll, they may go to a residential home. They may go to Missouri Hills, which is a, um, a state facility. And once they go into DYS, they're no longer in the city or county system. They're in the state system. I don't know if I confused issues or helped some. But. Well, while they're being detained, are, uh, they're not, they don't have education, do they? Yes, they do have education. And that's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up because the frustration over at the Justice Center for the adults is there's no way th for education. In the detention center, there is a school. And in the county, it's run by the special school district. At the city detention, it is actually a public school called Griscom. Um, and so they get, they get to go to school. We just had two kids yeah, graduate, graduate um, last week, I guess. Yeah. 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 And we try to, uh, Deborah and, Ke and uh, Clive try to, these were two kids over at county, and they tried to celebrate it and make it a big thing. Um, one, one of these kids is waiting to be, see if they're going to be certified. So um, it's a big celebration and an important thing for them to know this is a good thing. No matter what happens after tomorrow, you've done 
a great accomplishment you got through school. So they do go to school, but when they go over to the adult system, they can't, they can't do anything. They can't give them a schooling. We even tried, we had a kid before Raise the Age went into effect. You may have seen the, one of the guys, Steve Kroc, who is one of our board members. He is a retired school teacher. He even offered to go over and tutor one of the kids because the kid wanted to finish his GED, and they wouldn't let us do it. So being able to be in detention, even if you're certified as an adult, being over here has benefits that they don't get when they're in the adult system. And um, that's really important. I, I love that you told some stories I haven't heard yet. So okay. <laughs> I'm, they, I'm amazed at the things that they do and the, what the kids do. And so I'm gonna give it back to Clive because I'm sure he's got more he can tell you. Yeah, one of the things that I forgot is not only the kids, even the staff need our presence and their, you know, our care. Um, uh, they are compelled to do a lot of things, you know. Um, they are always, uh, always, you know, uh, they have the mind that something is going to happen or anything goes wrong, uh, they are going to, uh, they will be vindicated. They will have a, um, you know, problem. So I could see them. Um, how uh, uh, difficult for the staff. Um, some of the things they wanted, uh, you know, the, the government or the state to give them more, uh, you know, uh, help for them, but um, uh, they don't get. The, the challenging thing is they have less staff and they need to take care of, uh, you know, uh, the units only with that given staff. And also, whatever they have, the guns or whatever, the, you know, things that are given to them, uh, they feel it is not enough. And anything goes wrong, they're going to um, uh, really, uh, you know, pay for it. So the staff also needs our uh, presence and talk to them. They sometimes comment on, yes, sir. Maybe I missed it. How many detainees are in the detention center uh, at any one time? Number one, and then number two, uh, you, you must have some way to uh, keep a scorecard about outcomes with with these kids. I, I see a, a head shaking. No. Uh, <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, we, um, uh, I think the um, last time when I visited, it was about uh, uh, forty kids were there, and I think uh, we. I go to county. The city is more now. I think it is 44. Yeah. Um, after pandemic, it has it has gone up. We usually have 25, 26. That was the. But after pandemic, it is so strange. We don't know why, but it's always 40, 40 above. So altogether, around uh, um, 90 kids uh, are there. In those two detention centers, and one of the things I think. Two, that the numbers, the numbers may be up some because of the raise the age. There's a few kids that have come back over, but that's a handful. That's not, you know, a large number. But yeah, they, even the court is trying to look at the statistics and try to figure out why all of a sudden it's gone back up. Because as I said, there's a there's a number system that they use to determine if a kid goes stays in detention or or do, goes out um, into the community based program, but. <clears throat> so they, they're not really sure. When it comes to metrics, that's a big challenge for us because in the juvenile system, everything is confidential. So if we tell you a story, we will change the name. Or we may just tell it very generic, like a girl or a boy. Because you cannot, you really shouldn't know everything about them and, and pass that on outside of the doors of detention. So, and when a kid finally gets out of the system, if they haven't gone on to jail or whatever, you know, they're just glad they're out and they, they kind of disappear back into the community. Now, we have had kids that have connected with the chaplains after they've gone, and, we've, and we'll encourage them if they want to do that. Um, Deborah's had a couple of people. Chaplain Kevin has, I, I, Clive, you, you had a, some, a recent... Some just, strange. <laughs> yeah. So we do have some of that, but we don't have a way to say um, our chaplains did X, Y, Z, and it, 
gave this kind of outcome. But just like Kevin or Clive saying, hey, I, I've watched this girl from the time she, you know, she was 12 and now she's older. She's been reading the Bible. She's changed. She's done some things. Um, they just don't have a lot of stability in their lives, whether their home life isn't stable. And some of them have wonderful parents who really try, but they're, too, they're working two jobs or they got other kids they're trying to deal with. It, it's really a challenging thing. And one of the things that you hear from the staff, if you really spend some time with people like um, Rick Gaines, who was up there, he was the gentleman in a suit sitting down talking about what we do and how, it, how it's good for the kids. He, he will tell you and the other staff, community is so important. These are kids that don't have stable school. They may be moving around, so they move from schools. They come into detention, sometimes they're behind in their reading. God bless the teachers that work there because they really work with these kids to try to get them back to where they need to be. Um, and reading, we had one young girl who was reading a series of books, and I, I don't even remember the name of it, but she got to the third book, and it wasn't in there. The, you know, the library didn't have it at the detention center, so Deborah calls me and says, hey, can we find this book? So I found the book, I picked it up, I took it to Deborah. Deborah gave it to the girl. But while I got that book, I also got the series and took it over to City because I thought, if this young girl is energized by reading this series, there's going to be some girls sitting over at City that probably could do the same thing. That's the other thing. We have more girls right now than we've had. Yeah. Typically, we'll have one or two girls. We've had as many as five and six at the different detention centers. And uh, <clears throat> they are a lot of drama. <laughs> Anybody that's had teenage girls, and I was one with two sisters, so you know my parents went crazy. Um, they're, they're a lot of drama, but they can be very sweet, too. They can be very, you know, it's, it's when you can sit down and just spend time with them, they're just kids. And I've gotten to do that before COVID when we'd have birthday parties, be able to sit at the table with a unit and just talk to them and find out what's going on. And uh, my birthday is Christmas Day. So the board uh, the, sponsors the birthday party that happens in December. So we went there to do the birthday party before COVID. And the boy that was in the, that unit was in trouble because they had a scuffle. So they couldn't come down. So there, there wasn't a birthday boy there. But we still had the birthday party because they have pizza and cake. And so we you know, make sure they know that we're celebrating in, uh, this young man or whoever. And, as, and we also introduce ourselves as board members and, you know, whatever. And so when it got to me, I said, you know, so-and-so's not here, but I'm here and my birthday's in December. It's Christmas Day, so you, we can, you can help me celebrate. So I went to sit down at the table and the one kid looked at me and said, is it, is it a bummer? And I said, is what a bummer? He said, having a birthday that's on Christmas Day. I said, you know, sometimes, but it's my special day along with Jesus' special day. I mean, I, as an adult, it's not so bad. They got to talking about Christmas and stuff that they, and one kid said, I love it when my mom picks something out specially for me. I don't like it when she just gives me money. I prefer that she picks something out just for me. And I thought, oh, you know. That's when you know they're just kids, and um, and they've 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 had to be tough in their, they think they've had to be tough in their community. So we need to look in the community. I know you guys do a lot of things. I know you did. I see on Facebook you do things at Trinity with the food bank. And what we need to do is we need to work in the community. I see all this money from Rams. All I want to do is let's 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 put it into these communities that need help. You know. We could use public bathrooms in the city. Do you know how difficult it is for somebody to find a public bathroom? So what happens? You'll tell when you walk by a certain building. <laughs> it's really important that we look at our communities so that these kids maybe don't end up there. And uh, you know, I don't know what all the answers are, but I do know that um, 
as Chaplain Kevin said in the video, they're just looking for love. They're looking for acceptance. And they sometimes haven't had that very well. Please keep us on time, because <laughs> we could talk forever. <laughs> Anything, any other questions? Thank Beth you. and Clive, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. And in the nine plus years that I've been doing this, I've been here several times, and the good news is I've gotten to know so many of you. And um, some of you I knew before I got here because of the Junior League. And, and um, so I would come in here and people would go, why do you know so many people? And I said, well, it's just <laughs> from the community and having come back many times. So thank you for always being warm and welcoming. And thank you for your support because I know you have other groups that you support too, and we appreciate that. So and, thanks. And all the best to you in this, thank you. this chapter of your life. Yeah, I'm hoping it's about a lot of basketball games that my nephews play in. I'm getting tired of watching on the little screen. Um, I have two nephew, no, three nephews that have played college ball, so I'm excited to watch them. So me, I get to do it in person. <laughs> Just a reminder that upstairs uh, on the giving tree, there are ornaments for specifically for ECM, along with the other. Uh, three ministries that we're supporting during this time, so I encourage you, if you've not already done so, or even if you have already done so, uh, to pick up one of those ornaments. And again, today is the day that we're holding up um, on ECM. Yep. Uh, next week, we will hear from our, our, our fourth um, ministry that, that Beth has already um, uh, referenced a few minutes ago, and that is the Trinity Food Ministries. Um, so we'll have someone here who will be, be introducing uh, so, so we'll take a little, help us take a little deeper dive into that. But again, Clive and uh, Jeff, thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank bye you bye. All for being part of this. God bless you. Thank you.